Uh, this is Dr. Mark Lewandowski. I'm the uh, medical director and founder of Preventive Medicine and Cancer Care. We're now a little over a year old. And I was super excited to start the practice um, in Denver, being a very health conscious and proactive state. And um, uh, a few words about me and sort of why I started doing this really. I've uh, been in oncology for nearly, uh, in medicine for nearly 20 years and seen lots of traditional um, cancer and blood related um, issues as well as uh, sort of traditional bread and butter internal medicine issues. And um, having been in school for a ridiculously long time, started seeing a recurrent theme um, uh, of, of uh, patients coming in with with certain cancers like colon cancer, like breast cancer, um, like prostate cancer, and having very similar medical picture as far as other comorbidities, usually in the cardiovascular, diabetes, lifestyle uh, practice. And um, I, I was running um, uh, the breast and urologic oncology um, cancer program just recently at, at one of the hospitals here and started piloting a program so that patients would not just come in and address their immediate cancer-related concerns, and we wouldn't just talk about, well, how to treat your breast cancer, or prostate cancer, or colon cancer, but talk a little bit more about, well, what are the risk factors that contributed to this? Um, how to look at, at, at the whole portrait of your health, how to prevent this cancer, uh, or are there other cancers and other second primary cancers? And how does this play a part in a healthy lifestyle living and how does it affect other comorbidities? So I piloted that program and it was just such a success that, uh, and it was, it was so amazing for me to, to be a part of that, to actually engage in a, in a rapport and patient doctor dialogue that we all really strive for that I, uh, quit my daytime job and started doing this nearly full time uh, to bring this uh, to broader awareness and um, hence hence the introductory presentation. So why is it such an important matter to consider screening and prevention and what one needs to think about? Certainly identifying risk factors and personalizing what the person in front of you has is key. Our traditional medicine is focusing way more on population health, meaning that you know you, you look at the population of Denver or Colorado or the U.S. at large and make extrapolations to the person in front of you. But but really, we're we're trying to push precision and personal medicine way more than we had ever in the past. And and translating population health to personal health is really where we're trying to go. And that translates into early you know, hopefully early diagnosis, because we know that when we catch something earlier, by and large, outcomes are significantly better. And what's been really striking as I was looking into this and seeing what are the risk factors uh, for major um, cancer uh, development, we know that the majority of disease, and, and it's not just cancer, really the majority of disease, what ails us as a wealthy Western world country could really be prevented. So what, what, what specific conditions can really be um, detected early and hopefully prevented? Cancer is, is the focus of, 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 of this presentation and webinar, but it's not exclusive to cancer, really. It's certainly true for cardiovascular disease, for autoimmune disease, for um, Alzheimer's, for hypertension, blood pressure issues, diabetes, and weight issues. So let's delve right into the first topic, which is cancer. And I think the first thing we need to address is really what is cancer? Because it's a very scary word, by all means, the C word. And, and people, um, I, I think, de-emphasize what it means. So um, cancer is, is basically loss of normal cell control and cell growth. So if this is, if this is a normal uh, cell, the job of a normal cell is to divide and make daughter cells, so one, two. And then this, this cell likewise would divide as well. Now, we're human, we make mistakes. Our, um, our replication of, of cell material is not perfect. Nothing is 
and uh, for instance the aligning of the colon renews itself uh, with a few billion cells about every 10 days and uh, invariably mistakes like these happen this is when cellular dna the 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 code for for the cell makes a mistake and and uh, then the response of the body is to say oh, oh there is a mistake here i need to do here a curie i need to kill myself i need to die and that's the default mechanism for a cell now what happens if that doesn't happen so if this aberrant cell with some mutation which is precancerous at this point continues on making further mistakes then they start accumulating more and more and more and eventually the cancer develops now the reason why this is a screening and prevention program is because we cannot control how we come to this world what we've inherited from mom and dad is very much a function um, of you know how we picked our parents and how well we've done with that that determines the genetic makeup are we starting here are we starting there or are we starting at this point that we have really no control over however the the rate from which we go if there is a mistake from here to there to there to here could very much be under our control and very much influenced by nutritional factors by relational factors by environmental and exposure factors such that this process could take just a few years in certain cases or it could be decades one can arrest potentially in early stages or really slow things down or just um, zoom through from early mutations to to, ca to cancerous process how does this play out for instance in colon cancer because it's one of the more traditional uh, well-studied processes um, so if this is um, if this is the inside of the colon lining and this is an early polyp trying to develop um, um, and this is a, a frank invasive cancer traditionally we think that this process going from benign to malignant to invasive takes about 10 years and that's the reason why we recommend a colonoscopy uh, every 10 years for an average risk person thinking that this to this will be about 10 years however um, for folks who have certain genetic predispositions or environmental or other exposures this could be three years or this could be 20 plus years it really ought to be tailored to uh, to the to the person who's in front of us uh, so the bottom line is it does take years in, even in worst case scenario by and large to develop cancer pre-cancerous stage could often be reversed or really really uh, 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 slow down and preemptive screening makes a whole lot of sense in that department so let me pause for a second and just see if there are any questions that have come up uh, thus far that we um, can uh, quickly address and if there's nothing then I will proceed uh, with uh, just give me, give me a second. Let's see. I'm just going to type in the chat if anyone has any questions. Just one second. I'll just wait a couple of seconds. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't have any questions come through, so um, uh, we can go to me. Okay. So if, if there are no questions, I'll uh, I'll move on, continue, and uh, we'll break it intermittently to give folks an opportunity to to ask and and um, uh, have the questions answered, and then we'll we'll dedicate a little bit more time at the end, specifically towards question um, answer type of a format. So how significant is this for the US population at large? And it's a huge epidemic. Uh, one in two men is predicted to have an invasive um, cancer in their lifetime. And for women, it's one in three. Women are a little bit more uh, awesome and proactive and usually 
don't have just quite the same slew of um, uh, exposure risk factors as men do. So, so for them, the statistics is, uh, is a little bit better. So it's one in three, which is still super significant. Um, and I think one of the reasons why that is has been largely due to traditional medical apathy towards um, uh, cancer screening and detection. Um, namely, if this is so, if this is no cancer, this is how, say, we're born, or what, this is what happens to us in the early life. Cancer doesn't just miraculously happen. There is a there is an exponential growth, and then there is more um, of a uh, plateau, uh, uh, which which typically produces symptoms. So once symptoms happen, one is in this stage, and um, and depending on the cancer, it's usually a billion cells. Um, so one needs to have typically close to a billion cells for symptoms to develop, be it lung cancer, be it an abdominal cancer, for things to become that prominent and start compressing an organs, start causing pain, start causing cough, start ca causing problems with bowels or, or impingements of sorts or pressing of sorts. There needs to be about a billion cells. Now, the problem with that and the traditional um, approach of, well, but let's wait until symptoms begin and then we'll address it, it, it would be equivalent to um, really taking our car to a mechanic um, once the engine starts making really um, obnoxious noise, you know, uh, without any due uh, maintenance, no oil changes, no, no uh, irregular visits. You just you, you develop a significant problem. You come to the mechanic and you are told you need to change your engine. Now, at this point, you know, with a billion cells, depending on the cancer, you can have upwards of 90 plus percent likelihood of these uh, cells metastasizing and spreading distantly. So we've recognized that and started trying to lower the, the detection limit for cancer to something that's maybe a little bit more palatable. And with scans, we can we can now detect cells, uh, cell burden of about half a million cells, so 500,000 cells, which is great. It's a 20-fold uh, drop from here to there. Symptoms typically are not happening. This is often called incidental findings. Or, for instance, in the world of lung cancer, the lung cancer screening CAT scans have been approved for early detection. And the premise is once you know, there are about half a million, uh, half a million cells. The likelihood of spread is lower here than it is there, which is which is true. With novel technology, however, and what we're learning is that you you can really drop with novel biomarkers and DNA-based um, uh, detection methodologies our ability to detect cancer to maybe even a few hundred cells. It's it's really trying to lower the threshold of detection so that we're way early and we're, we're trying to beat the curve. Now, how does it play out, for instance, in lung cancer? As many of you probably know, lung cancer is the number one killer in the US and the Western world. It kills more than uh, people than all of the other most common uh, uh, cancers combined. So the next uh, five most common uh, cancers pale in comparison to the cancer deaths from lung cancer. And, and uh, it, it's been a welcome change to have CAT scans be approved for, for screening. However, having said that, um, the criteria for, the, for, for using CAT scans are so stringent and one needs to fit the mold so specifically that two thirds of folks who are at risk and who would develop lung cancer are not deemed eligible for screening CAT scans because they are not quite of the same of their ripe age, of, of the right smoking history or exposure history. So, so the way things stand right now, two thirds of lung cancers um, would, be would be missed by the, by the screening technologies. And what we're anticipating with, with a lot of excitement in, in the cancer screening world is, is uh, what, what's been more widely known as liquid biopsies. These are signatures from cancer cells that are um, that we can pick up in blood and other secretions 
um, with uh, lung cancer being touted as the uh, as number one cancer for which this is going to be used, and some of these testing um, uh, uh, options are going to be available commercially where it's paid within really six months. How does it play out for other cancers? So for colon cancer, for instance, as uh, some of you may know, uh, the traditional recommendations for colon cancer detection was starting a colonoscopy starting age 50. Um, and, um, and it's been shown that depending how much time an endoscopist, a gastroenterologist, spends in the colon, uh, that determines how well they pick up a lesion or they miss it. So this is uh, this is a cancer that that's uh, sitting on the right side of the bowel. It's not a static entity. It's not just sitting there looking pretty and smiling and waiting to invade. It's shedding. It's literally literally pooping out. You know, you're excreting cancer cells that go out through the body and are excreted in feces and we can actually pick up the debris the the the, uh, the, um, the cellular material and the dna uh, in in the feces and we can study the dna of of, of, of that content and detect DNA cancer with with very high precision over 95 percent likelihood of being able to detect it and that sort of gave rise to a test called Cologuard that is now approved for colon cancer. So it's a, it's a very useful adjunct for folks who are uh, maybe in the intermediate um, um, uh, consideration uh, for, for screening um, and, and who, uh, for whom colonoscopy just may not be sufficient as the only, as the only modality. It's not a replacement, but a great adjunctive test. Um, in, in addition, there are, uh, uh, there are things that are called capsule endoscopy. So it's a little bullet that one swallows that goes through one's uh, esophagus. So that's the food pipe that connects um, the stomach to the small bowel to the large bowel. It looks for changes in, this, in, the, in the structure of the esophagus uh, at the mucus lining, uh, at bleeding uh, uh, locations, as well as cancer. It's is super nifty addition to, to the traditional uh, modalities that are used for, for detection. How about the traditional prostate cancer screening? So this is a cross section so through a prostate, uh, prostate gland. And what we're seeing is this is normal prostate here. This is a needle that's trying to biopsy a cancer. And, um, and this is a cancer. This is in two different colors. So this is a low, low grade uh, prostate cancer. And in the middle, there is a high grade prostate cancer. So two points to demonstrate. A, a needle would very likely miss this cancer because you know, rel relative size wise, it's like le looking for a needle in a haystack. It is just too much tissue, not enough needle. Now, traditionally, often urologists use six to 12 cores, so basically 12, six to 12 of these needles improving the likelihood of detection. However, if a needle goes through here, one will get the full sense of security that this is a lower risk cancer as opposed to a needle going through here, going for the core of the prostate biopsy. So what we now can incorporate as well, again, depending on one's risk, their tumor markers and, and their exam, is what's called urine prostate biopsy. So one pees in a cup and excretes uh, these bad guys. This is tumor debris and tumor DNA that is peed out. And you can very simply send this off to a lab and get in like a 93 plus percent accuracy of DNA prostate, prostate cancer and if it's high risk. So it, it just, it really, it really, personalizes and takes away from some of the uh, uh, traditional limitations that we've, that we've had previously uh, and, and helps us to often avoid biopsies that may not be needed or be a little bit more concerned and vigilant about people who might otherwise appear fine. So um, let, me, uh, uh, let me actually talk about breast cancer before breaking for for a little bit more questions, because I think this is um, uh, this is very germane, and um, we we've had a lot of controversy about screening. 
of breast cancer. So, as you probably know, that um, uh, mammograms have been traditionally recommended uh, for women for uh, early detection and screening for breast cancer. However, there's been a lot of debate whether or not uh, they save lives, how helpful are they, at what age one should start, and is it really worthwhile? And, and I think a huge part of that discussion really has to do with what type of imaging is a woman having, uh, at what age is she starting, and who's reading it? Uh, mammography is, is a technology that's 120 years old plus, and I would bet that none of the folks in the audience use cars uh, for their routine day-to-day uh, -day operations or cell phones for that matter that are uh, anywhere in that, in, in that time frame range. Um, but yet when it comes to medical technology, we often lean very heavily on things that are decades uh, 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 old and, and we think that that's fine um, and, tr and, and that's just not. So let me explain why. So this is a traditional two-dimensional mammogram. It's a cross-section slice, slice through, um, through a woman's breast. And this is what's called dense breast tissue. The wider the tissue, the more uh, it has connective tissue and, and the more obscuring um, it looks on imaging. It's sort of equivalent to, um, since most of, our, of the audience is from Denver, is um, trying to find a nearing after one of our nice winter storms with snowstorms. If you drop a white earring on snow, it's very, very difficult to find because it's obscured by the background. Um, and, and that's exactly what happens with, with two-dimensional traditional uh, mammograms and breast cancer. There is actually a lesion sitting right here, which would be quite easy to miss. On a three-dimensional uh, mammogram, which is really, uh, by and large, ought to be the standard of care right now, one can see that there is a spot, cancer spot, right here, which is much easier to detect. But in fact, an MRI picture of a lesion is, is way, way more accurate and way more um, telling of, of the picture. And not only does it look more prominent, uh, but also uh, would be much better at showing lymph nodes as is depicted by the triple arrows here. So. I can't tell you how many times women would come in to me initially but with shattered false sense of security, meaning you know someone in her forties would come in and say, "Hey, I just had a mammogram done you know like six months ago, and I'm feeling the slump, and we evaluated, and lo and behold, it's breast cancer and the reason for that is if if a woman is in her forties, she has dense breasts by almost definition, the likelihood that a two-dimensional mammogram is going to de 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 detect with good accuracy um, a lesion is abysmally low. It's going to miss two and three, potentially. So we really ought to stratify women into low, intermediate, or high risk and choose appropriate modalities rather than go, well, this is a 40-year-old woman. You need to start screening mammograms. I'm going to send you for this. This is a perfect waste of a test. Um, and moreover, insurance recognizes this. And for women who are high risk, this is approved. Let me say this again. MRIs are approved by insurance, which goes, you know, which says a lot for high risk women. It's just unfortunately we don't appropriately risk stratify women based on their family and exposure history, and we should. So let me break again and uh, and open the floor for uh, for um, questions or quick discussion before proceeding. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mark. It's some some pretty uh, good information that I would say, like even for myself, you know, you're not thinking about this stuff all the time. You're not like really aware, and uh, I think it's you know uh, you know the best way. To, to really treat something is to prevent it from happening. Um, I do, we do have some questions that were sent. Just check the live chat real quick, um, see if anybody has any questions. Feel free to list any questions in the chat. Um, 
Okay, so uh, first question, uh, uh, which I think is a good question. It says, uh, this is from Diane from Boulder. It says, if I watch my diet and I exercise and I feel like I'm generally healthy, um, uh, is that doing enough to prevent cancer? Is that, is it, do I, should I feel like I'm in the green basically? Thank you, Dan, for the question. It's excellent, and it's really at the core of what we're going to be uh, discussing um, as, as we uh, go through some of the slides and prevention. It, it, it's, it's been shown traditionally that in America, two-thirds of basically Americans, or often even the Europeans, don't really know what constitutes risks, a risk of cancer, and, and, and what prevention really is. So. Um, so we, we by and large think that if I don't chain smoke and I don't bake myself under the sun, I'm okay. Uh, th there is so much misinformation about what diet is, what relation, no um, health is, um, what exposure risks are, that when we think we're okay, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're okay. It, it, it's, um, it, it's interesting, like in the psychology world, People who think that they have a problem, like there is a definition of mental illness, right? And, and that goes something like that. Uh, if someone thinks that they're fine, more likely they aren't fine. But if you think that you're not doing well emotionally and mentally, it means that you're healthy. So uh, with, with, with uh, diet, exercise, um, relationships, which very much play into the risk, um, th there is lots of confusing information it's very hard to sometimes partial out what healthy exercise is what are the healthy say proportions of what one should ingest protein carbohydrate fat wise and people might think that they're fine but in fact they're not necessarily in the optimal um, realm a and that's part of the focus I mean, actually that's a huge focus of the program trying to dispel some of those myths and trying to use the best evidence we have for that. Um, and part of that will be addressed a little bit more um, towards the end of the presentation when I, um, when I show uh, rates of cancer in the, in the US and the developed world as compared to the developing world. Um, I think that'll shed some light on, on, on that a little bit more. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Sure, let's, let's do one more and then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll address more questions at the end. Okay, um, so this is from Tom from Denver. He says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 32. He says, can I wait until I'm 50 or 60? You know, oh, no, sorry. He says 40 or 50 or so until this is relevant for him. It, it, it's a great question. Thank you for that, Tom. Uh, so, again, the, the program is screening and prevention. It's when I see folks in their 50s and 60s, they may very well have done six plus decades of hard living. And what we're focusing on is very much screening now because the exposures have happened, meaning their whatever DNA they've inherited from mom and dad has been bombarded but by whatever choices and life exposures they've had and at this point we're certainly focusing significantly on well how do we adopt say quote unquote healthy lifestyle but it would be very foolish to uh, to send someone to to the you know to the Tibet mountain top and have them meditate for for a decade without addressing and, and doing the due diligence on the exposures that have happened. So I frankly encourage folks to come in earlier because when someone comes in in their thirties and early forties, there's just so much more that could be done from an education standpoint, from proactive standpoint. We're not, we have way more options and choices as opposed to when someone is in their sixties and we're trying to now mitigate or screen more. So I would say the bottom line is when someone's younger, 
there is way more option to emphasize prevention. Um, and when someone is, you know, thinks it's a little bit more relevant for them, you know, in their uh, in their late 50s, 60s, and, and most folks become a little bit more conscious in that regard, probably around their fifth, you know, decade, um, uh, then there is fair amount of risk mitigation that needs to be done already. Uh, Mark, do uh, this looks like a very quick question. If you don't mind, we just take this one real quick. Um, this is from Kim. She says, does the thermography work for breast cancer screening? You, you broke up there for, for a bit, Vic. So, oh, uh, sorry. <clears throat> this is from uh, Quick just had a, Kim looks like she just had a quick question. It came through the chat. Thermography. Um, Is that the question that, about that She asked, uh, does thermography work for breast cancer screening? Uh, it, it, you, so uh, I will tell you that I don't use it um, for the following reasons. Um, we, uh, it, it hasn't been as vetted and sort of standardized and as a as number of other more um, established modalities like 3D mammogram and MRI. And uh, it's, um, it, it's sort of trying to use the part, partial claim to fame is the use of metabolism um, as, the, um, uh, as a differentiator between normal cells and cancer cells. So when, when the cancer cell is present and then makes you know, something like this, this spot would, would, uh, would be expected, if it's cancerous, to be hotter on the thermogram uh, because it's more metabolically active. And we have amazing uh, study, uh, we have amazing imaging modalities like PET scans, for instance, that can really zoom in on that. Um, thermography is not, is not as helpful. So I kind of think of uh, metabolism-based techniques if I'm closer towards cancer or I want to maybe even look at the whole body. For breast cancer, for instance, we have such amazing modalities like breast MRI is just so much better and so much more um, precise and, and it can be read by really excellent uh, breast imaging folks that I would rely uh, on breast MRIs way more than I would on thermography. And if I'm concerned enough based on imaging of this nature, I would probably go to like the ultimate thermography, which would be more of a PET scan. So let me, uh, let me uh, you know, break from questions then and then uh, get back to the slides and then we'll open up the discussion with, uh, again as, as we're coming close to, to the end. So um, um, uh, we were talking about um, liquid biopsies and hard to detect cancers. W what are these liquid biopsies? We know that traditionally cancers like these, pancreatic, upper gastric, esophageal, ovarian, bladder, have been really difficult, and lung, have been really difficult to detect. And what we've learned from, the, from them is that they're not static entities that sit there and just look ugly and don't interact with the, with the host, with the immune system, with the blood uh, uh, vessels. In fact, what they do is that they shed their DNA and debris material into the bloodstream. Be it breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, the more aggressive the cancer, the more it actually interacts with the immune system and the, uh, and the host, and the more it sheds the genetic material into the bloodstream. And now we can take a simple blood test, actually, and with upwards 80% accuracy, detect aggressive cancers. And what do I mean by, like, do I mean all cancers? No, the, the more aggressive cancers are more likely to be detected. And we just had an annual meeting for our cancer screening oncologist and lung cancer, um, pancreatic cancer, stage one and two. So these are the early cancers uh, can be detected at very, very high rates with a simple blood test. Um, it, it, it's amazing. It, it's really, it's really revolutionizing the way we're approaching this. Now, again, this need, I don't think this should be done in everyone. It needs to be risk stratified and appropriately used for people who are at risk. So I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and remind you that, to, 
to go back to sort of the reason why why an oncologist started doing more prevention and and, and more comprehensive global health. Uh, if you recall the uh, the slide with one mutation leading to second, third, fourth, and finally cancer being sort of a, a, a stepwise process, you can actually look at cardiovascular health in a very similar um, shape, uh, in a very similar way, vein. So this is this is the heart, and this is the main artery that feeds the heart called left anterior descending artery. Um, we are looking on the inside of this blood vessel. We've just dissected it open, it's split open, and we're looking through the cross section. So when we come to this world, we are like this. We have an intima, which is one cell layer thick. This is a layer that that is um, coating the inside, and um, what, whatever is coursing through the through, through the blood vessel is coursing very nicely until we start typically getting into, and this is to address the question, am I okay in my 30s and 40s? Uh, until probably, depending where we live, maybe late teens, maybe even 20s to 30s, uh, once we have cholesterol and animal products and sort of typical American exposures, we start having these fatty streaks developing. So this is cholesterol and fat-based deposition between first and second layer. And the body says, uh oh, this is a foreign material that doesn't belong there. I'm going to try to get rid of it. And I'm going to try to get rid of it the way I normally get rid of things by, by getting red cells and white cells in this space and trying to fight off this as I would an infection. Now, the problem with this, it's not an endogenous, meaning it's not something that it's not a viral process, it's not a bacterial process that you can get rid of. It's something that is coursing through the inside of the blood vessel and gets deposited here. So the body cannot get rid of this and, it, and, and hence it cannot get rid of this plaque. So what it starts doing is that it starts forming a wall again around this, trying to wall this off of the, the, the square and abscess. And this is called the growing calcium deposit of plaque. And it gets more inflamed and growing and growing and starts being unstable. And this would be a heart attack. Now, when we get someone on a treadmill, as we do in traditional internal medicine practice, we're typically looking for unstable plaque. We're looking at, if you notice that the diameter of this blood vessel is less than it is of this blood vessel, but the inside is the same. So what the body is trying to do is it's trying to keep the, the internal caliber of this blood vessel as open and patent as possible so that you don't feel chest pain. But when you get stressed here, you cannot widen, you can't dilate, you can't become more open. And that's what, that's what really is being looked at when you get on the treadmill. The problem with that is be, from here to here it could be as few as six hours. From here to there could be 30 years. So we know that we've done like uh, like autopsy reports of marine of marines and other soldiers who have succumbed in action when they had autopsies they were here in their 20s and 30s they it took you know another maybe 20 to 30 years to manifest this but even in their 30s one could detect here and when we look at the blood vessels health we can we don't have to look at um, a uh, treadmill we can actually detect is someone holding here? Are they holding there? Are they holding there? And it's just like cancer. Are they are they mutation free? Do they have a couple? Do they have you know four or five? Or they're about to develop a cancer? It is really the same common denominator. And for that reason, you know the the, the disease screening it, it really ought to be done in a more personalized and appropriate fashion. It's really about standard testing as we do in traditional medicine because of time pressures, insurance pressures, um, and sometimes really expertise versus more personalized screening program that, that is tailored more to the person in front of us. But why don't we get this done normally and traditionally? Well, because a traditional primary care physician would have you know, 11 to 13 minutes per visit to, to, to normally address all the concerns. Uh, and, in traditional medicine, we really work for insurance. The, the insurance dictates the level of reimbursement, of level of 
commitment and involvement of certain excellence criteria for uh, for demonstration so that many doctors uh, spend actually way more time charting in their medical record spending you know time caressing their computer for 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 um, uh, documentation than they do face to face because ultimately the face to face interaction becomes a vehicle for uh, not uh, notation and, re and reimbursement they don't have the time and if, if one is seeing you know even a concierge uh, internal medicine doctor they may not have the expertise to discuss the novel testing and, and the implications and I can't tell you how often I get referrals as an oncologist or hematologist from various primary care doctors that have gotten tests that they have a hard time interpreting be it molecular tests or genetic tests uh, so so it, it's not necessarily within their scope so um, health conscious and proactive individuals can certainly certainly have choice and and i don't think that um and i, and I see this all the time that combining primary care and continuity with real cutting edge molecular cancer disease screening options is really where we're excited to go and we offer that as a program and we call it total care program to address the whole portrait of the individual so who should really be screened uh, in, in my mind, um, it, it, folks who have personal family history of cancer or significant medical issues really need to give this thought. Folks who are certainly over 40 um, uh, ought to consider this way more seriously. Folks who have uh, traditional uh, risk factors uh, of the Western uh, world um, uh, that live in, being overweight, having had previous or current smoking having pre-diabetes or diabetes and um, and uh, traditional and certainly high-risk occupational exposures like oil and gas, like inhalation industries, like metal-based industries, uh, textile industries, um, automotive industries, th those put folks uh, at, at higher risk for inhalation. And lifestyle and diet play a huge role. And if nothing else, getting that information under your belt as a solid foundation for education is absolutely key. Um, this is a, one of my favorite slides uh, because it's super provocative, but I think it, it addresses the, uh, uh, the underlying difference in the global rates of cancer. And um, so this is looking at the incidence of breast cancer, in this case, uh, across the globe. And, um, and it puts, it pegs the U.S. Uh, to the rest of the traditional world. It, it actually, it's actually North America. So um, we are nearly, so in, which includes Canada and the U.S. And if Canadians are a little bit healthier lifestyle-wise than us, so I, I bet if, if this was parceled out to be U.S. only, we probably would be number one. But we wouldn't be number one in health. We would be number one in rates of breast cancer in the world. Um, we have 300, so we have threefold higher risk of breast cancer than the, than the developing world. So that's 300% higher incidence. For prostate cancer, it's really very, very similar. Um, it's, but that risk is tenfold. So it's a thousand percent difference between the developing world versus us. The only place uh, which has higher rates of prostate cancer is New Zealand and Australia, which is the, cap the dairy capital of the world, just, just saying. So, and we know that when folks move from here to there, so when, when um, uh, World War II experiments, you know, sort of urban experiments were done with, with um, um, South Asian and Asian migration to the U.S., in about within two generations, really, this risk almost goes back to the uh, goes up to this risk, and we know that even within, uh, say, uh, the uh, Central Asia, uh, there is there is almost this type of discrepancy between urban dwellers and um, uh, and um, 
villagers. So it is, this is not genetic. This is, so much of this is um, what we're exposed to and what we can prevent. Uh, so let me stop with that and open the floor for questions and, um, uh, and see what I can do to help. Yeah, thanks for that, Mark. That was a very deep and insightful presentation. Certainly things that I don't think about on a daily basis, um, if maybe at all. Uh, yeah, so in the chat, uh, please feel free to, to list any questions. Um, there are a few that I've received personally. Um, okay, so I'll just... I'll just be looking for, for any questions in the chat, but it will start off with a few. Um, give me one second. Okay, Sherry asked uh, if you can just repeat what you said about the breast cancer piece. I think she may have joined in uh, midway in your answer. Um, you were saying something about uh, uh, something like why why typical breast cancer screening now isn't sufficient and I don't think I don't think she heard the whole answer do you mind uh, giving a quick summary of yeah so let me go back to the slide and just uh, um, and address it so um, so it traditional it, it, it is really based on one's risk um, age breast density and risk factors um, that have to do with personal exposures, hormone exposures, lifestyle, and family history. Traditionally, we've been doing, we've been offering two-dimensional um, uh, mammograms for everyone, and it's just a crappy test, frankly. Uh, we have data um, that shows that for young women who have dense breasts, um, this can miss sixty plus a percent of lesions in the breast. Um, and uh, if someone is elderly, has, a, you know, has basically largely uh, you know, fat replaced and stroma replaced um, uh, breast, then, then the two-dimensional mammogram uh, is quite decent and will pick up probably most lesions. But for a young woman, with any additional risk factors, and arguably really without any additional risk factors, but based on her breast density, um, a traditional two-dimensional mammogram is really, really inadequate to um, detect uh, breast cancer early. Um, Three-dimensional does better, but for uh, but if one compares these type of type of modalities with, with two-dimensional mammogram, three-dimensional mammogram versus a breast MRI. The breast MRI is just much more sensitive and has a much better ability to detect um, lesions in the breast. Now, not all of them are going to be cancer. So the, the, the upside of using breast MRI is that it's much better able to detect spots in the breast. However, the downside is that those spots may not be, may not be cancerous. So it really has to do with who is reading them, what is the threshold of suspicion, what are the risk factors, and what's the whole portrait and picture. Does it mean that you know, something like this is, is cancer until proven otherwise, and absolutely needs to be biopsied. But if it's something like this, or like that, then is that something that needs to be monitored somehow differently? Hopefully that answers the question, and if not, please uh, 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 let me know. Yeah, if 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 you have any lingering questions, you could always return to this page. There's a, a form on the bottom uh, of this of the webinar page, and uh, you can just put in um, your email and uh, some basic information in your question, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, it looks like uh, uh, you know you uh, question. Um, you, Mark, you you mentioned the, something about insurance coverage, and I think uh, with relate kind of related to this question, a lot of people feel like, okay, if I have a uh, family doctor and 
you know, he's kind of looking out for me or she's kind of looking out for me and, uh, you know, he can refer me out. Um, but you mentioned something earlier about insurance um, and kind of like how insurance dictates your level of care. So uh, this person asked, why, what does, what is insurance keeping me from getting in terms of screening or in terms of uh, prevention, I guess? Mm. It, it's, it's a complex question and um, uh, I don't want to ramble on, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to address it the best I can. Um, I, I think it, it's a fallacy to think that insurance is our friend. Insurance is, is a modality for that, that tries to merge guidelines with profitability. Um, and um, um, insurance-based recommendations are typically general um, population-based recommendations. They don't have to do with Jane or Bob or Jack. They look at you know, thousands and tens of thousands of Jocks and Jacks and Bobs and Janes and, and, and kind of try to say, well, for the population at large, with um, this seems to potentially work, and uh, um, and uh, this often does not entail uh, novel technologies or up and coming technologies. Um, so they certainly would cover, uh, for instance. So if someone's uh, someone's intermediate high intermediate risk um, for breast cancer. They would cover this, they would cover this, they typically would not cover the breast MRI because they would say, well, if you're high intermediate risk, and that's usually defined as 15 to 20% risk of breast cancer, then it's not sufficiently high for us to be worried about that. And we're not going to pay for it. Um, and actually some insurances, depending on the plan, even say that if you're over 20%, even though we should cover it by most guidelines, we aren't going to because of this or this or that limitation. Their emphasis is not necessarily keeping the person in front of me as a doctor healthy. It's it's combination of general guidelines and finances, um, and it's not really tailored to personal health. It's looking at uh, the average height of. It's like trying to estimate the average height in Denver and trying to see how, you know, maybe a little bit more of a shorter or maybe a bit more of a taller patient that I might be seeing fits into that general height algorithm in the whole Denver Metro. But if it's someone who is, you know, a little bit more gravitationally endowed or a little bit more taller, right, they uh, we may very well miss the mark. Just like the slide I showed with, uh, with colon cancer development. We know that on average, one needs to get a colonoscopy every 10 years. However, depending on what their predisposition is, risk factor-wise, genetically, lifestyle exposure-wise, that risk could be three years or it could be 20 plus years. But the insurance is going to say every 10 years. Or if you have a certain uh, abnormality, then maybe we need to change that to a shorter time interval. But, but they're not going to they're not going to tell the primary care doc how to do it. That really falls into the expertise of the person who is screening them. And unfortunately, um, that expertise could be lacking because if so, the program that I'm describing is really aimed to look at the whole person and, and their whole person cancer risk. And that's addressing like 10 to 15 more common cancers that one might develop. Typically, to do justice to that in a traditional setting, one would need to see all the subspecialists that, that deal with that. So, you know, maybe like a head and neck surgeon, a lung cancer doctor, a um, pulmonologist, a thoracic surgeon, then a gastroenterologist, a, you know, a gastric surgeon, a urologist, uh, a gynecologist. It, the list just goes on and on. It just becomes very not feasible. And that's, I think, Part of the reason why there is such a need for this it's not being done expertise wise by folks who have that background and to hop around between different specialists 
would be super difficult uh, and naturally feasible. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, um, yeah, thanks, thanks Mark. Um, the next question comes from the chat. Uh, how do the medical genetic lab tests compare to the multiple tests needed for each of the different possible cancers? So the, uh, the genetic testing is a two-part um, process. One is, um, and I just saw uh, a patient like that, based on her family exposure, she is at very high risk for cancer and needs to have the genes that she's inherited from mom and dad screened and tested. So we need to know what the starting point is. So is she holding, um, is she holding here or is she holding here potentially? Because it really doesn't seem like based on, on, the, on the history, uh, you know, this is someone who's got normal looking cells. And depending on where one is, then we need to tailor, you know, for someone who is here, the, 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 the aggressiveness of screening is going to be quite different than if someone's here. So the first part that the genetic testing is, is aiming to answer is where is, where is one starting point? What, are, what is the genetic makeup? What are they at risk for? Um, it's sort of like the, the approach that Angelina Jolie did uh, when she had the prophylactic mastectomy because she had one of the BRCA genes that she inherited and, and she knew it. So she kind of went through the math of what is my likelihood of breast cancer with BRCA genes. And she chose to have prophylactic mastectomy because she was starting out, you know, somewhere here. And, and she's like, I don't want to wait until I'm here and, 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 and react. I'll, I'll, I'll prophylactically remove the tissue at this point. Now, it's a personal decision, but when we know when we're starting, then we can make more tailored and appropriate decisions for us. Um, so that's the first uh, part. So we need to know where we're holding and where the starting point is. The second is um, has to do with with this. So what yeah, what can we detect as far as tumor burden? Are we waiting to detect? cancer when symptoms start, which is a billion cells, are we going to fit some of the maybe um, insurance criteria for uh, lung cancer detection when we're at half a million cells? Or because of certain risk factors, we want to drive this detection threshold as low as possible and, and, and really push it to maybe a few hundred cells. We can certainly wait until we're here, but we know what those outcomes are. We know that for bad actor cancers, this is, you know, waiting until symptoms is super dangerous and portends a very poor survival. Looking at lower thresholds of detection here saves lives. We know that. And driving it lower aims to reduce that uh, burden of cancer detection to even lower thresholds and hopefully improve outcomes in the process. So I think those are the two part answers. Uh, again, if, if you need a clarification, please shoot, uh, please shoot a uh, clarifying or additional questions. I'm, I'd be happy to entertain them. Okay. Um, this next question says, uh... So I think it seems like a more general question. What can I do to start being more sensitive to uh, screening and and prevention? I think I think she means like um, like just like things that people can start doing today. Um, so I, I would certainly not knowing not knowing where one's holding as far as medical uh, risk factors and. Uh, other medical issues, family history, setting all of that aside and just saying, well, what, what should one focus on a little bit more just on a day-to-day -day basis? I would, um, I would probably encourage 
being a little bit less American in the way we um, uh, we eat, we interact, and we relate to other people, as well as how we move. So being, uh, I'd probably say, you know, the, the most boring things would be walk, you know, walking 45 minutes to an hour most days of the week, uh, trying to uh, be, uh, trying to be a little bit more um, uh, consumptive of, of fruits and vegetables. So having the vast majority of calories come from the animal, of, so, sorry, from the plant kingdom. Um, the, the, the thresholds that I would typically recommend eventually, ultimately, is maybe moving towards, you know, 80 plus percent of calories coming from the, uh, fr from the uh, plant-based diets that are whole food. I'm not, I'm not touting being a vegan or being a strict vegetarian, uh, but, but there are certain things like uh, using more raw products, using more nuts, uh, using less processed food, less refined carbs. And it's not really about sugars and carbs per se. It's about really having whole foods and less processed products that are um, uh, certainly within the realm of our control. Um, being less sedentary. Notice I'm not saying go to the gym, uh, you know, work out and then spend the rest of the day in a chair. We know that sedentary lifestyle is not fully really offset by you know, um, bodybuilding or, or lifting weights, right? It, it, it really needs to be a balanced approach to, to uh, uh, walking, uh, soothing oneself, eating healthier, and, 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 and moving in that, in that direction um, in a gradual manner. Meaning, it's, we have so many sexy diets, you know, Atkins diet, paleo diet, uh, South Beach diet that plain don't work. And the reason for that is we try to induce people to buy in like 100%, start doing radical change overnight. That just doesn't work. Meeting where the person is at, figuring out what the barriers are to, to moving to that, to, to that lifestyle and, and taking small baby steps, but in a consistent fashion and understanding what they mean and, and how they reduce their risk of major maladies um, that affect us it, it, it's really way more meaningful than saying, okay, starting tomorrow, I'm going to become a vegan. I'm going to, you know, meditate for an hour and I'm going to jog for two hours. That's just not sustainable, doesn't work. And what's been shown is those type of drastic changes usually backfire and people do worse. So I would say consistent, intentional, and mindful practice towards health and it and personalizing it to what makes sense to that person as far as the key components of activity, diet, exercise, relationships, and medical health. I think I will need to wrap up there. Okay. Uh, so are, you, we, are you are you out of time, Mark? Uh, you... I, I, I've got another uh, three minutes uh, to um, so if there is another uh, quick so, um, I'm happy to do so yeah, this, we have a we have a question about kind of what you're you're offering and uh, this uh, John from Denver asked um, I read about your programs on your website uh, can you let me know the level of support um, including screening that you offer uh, personally, like basically, I think he's trying to ask, like, what what is your offering? Um, like, what kind of what does it look like? What does that service look like that that um, preventative medicine and cancer care provides? Sure, I'm I'm happy to address it. And uh, John, you're most welcome to uh, reach out to us and, and talk to. Uh, to myself or the uh, practice manager for more detail would be happy to give you more in the way of that information. But the, the, the two, uh, uh, so, so there are really three programs. Well, one is for folks who have cancer um, or blood uh, related issues that they need help with. So um, th that is uh, 
uh, one offering. I'm going to set that aside right now because that's really not the emphasis of what I'm talking about. So the other two programs are one called Total Care, which combines the cancer screening and detection basically with primary care and personalized attention to where they're holding. And the other one is uh, cancer screening. So it, it takes primary care out of it and uh, and just gives someone um, their uh, most common cancer risks. So 10 to 15 most common cancer risks where they're holding, uh, where um, the averages are and where they could be with, with specific um, with specific interventions that are tailored towards them. Um, so it, it's really looking at cancer and other critical illnesses because there are so many common denominators and telling them, well, your, your prostate cancer risk is X, your breast cancer risk is Y, your cardiovascular risk is, is, is Z, you know, and we could reduce it by say 50% uh, if we do one, two, three, and this is what we need to do. Uh, this is the detection program that we use. Um, it typically incorporates um, a comprehensive uh, 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 blood panel that looks at one's metabolism, inflammation, critical illness, um, uh, and tumor markers. Uh, it incorporates, in certain cases, additional testing that's aimed to, to look at, um, at certain organs. Uh, so if someone's at high risk for colon cancer, um, then, uh, then focusing maybe on stool studies or blood studies that are related towards that detection. Um, yeah. So it has common elements, meaning looking at their uh, at the health of the abdominal organs uh, uh, with, with certain imaging uh, modalities, looking at their metabolism, their uh, nutritional health, their inflammation markers, their tumor markers. That's sort of the comprehensive initial intake. And then uh, based on their personal story, where they're personally holding, what they're personally at risk for, then tailoring additional steps towards them. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to give more sort of detail in that regard uh, to folks who are interested. And John, welcome to reach out to us. Okay, thanks so much, Mark. Um, I know you have to uh, jump off um, before everyone heads heads out, I just want to offer everyone, um, you know, as a thank you for being on the webinar that um, uh, preventive medicine and cancer care, uh, led by uh, Dr. Mark Lewandowski, um, is happy and willing for all participants on the webinar to meet with him for an hour at the um, at the location, at the practice. And uh, there's no obligation or any push, anything like that. Um, it's just to uh, explore if this is something that's good for, for you, um, or if you have any other questions. Uh, again, you could also put your questions as they come up. Maybe uh, you have some questions, your, your family has some questions, or spouse has some questions. Just throw them into the contact form um, at the bottom of the page. And I uh, just uh, wanted to thank everyone again. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we really appreciate, appreciate it. And I know Mark is very dedicated into uh, providing a great resource to the Denver community um, so that, you know, as you can see, like this, this is a big problem and two men and one in three women are getting cancer, then um, much, much cheaper, much, much easier, uh, <laughs> much, uh, much, much less difficult on your family, um, including yourself, to take proactive steps instead of reactive steps towards um, towards preventing it. So uh, thank you guys for joining us and th um, for all your time and answering everyone's questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, I am uh, was thrilled to share and uh, uh, would be happy to connect and uh, discuss um, or address personal uh, further questions or, uh, or uh, uh, sort of meet and greet uh, type of options. So have a uh...
blessed rest of the day and uh, all the best. Good. Thanks, Mark.